This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Humanity has a way of altering and even severely damaging our environment and climate, and it would be nice to be able to avoid doing that, or at least mitigate the problems it causes, so let's see what's in our toolbox. So today we'll be looking at ways to mitigate, reverse, or even amplify climate changes using only near-term technologies, which for SFIA usually means we either have the tech today or it is comfortably on the radar. If you're a channel regular you won't be surprised that we won't be focusing entirely on carbon dioxide based climate change or even just man-made approaches, and you also won't be surprised that a lot of the solutions we discuss involve mega engineering we've looked at for terraforming other planets. For those of you who are new to the channel, a lot of the concepts we discuss can seem rather over the top at first glance, but are always rooted in hard science. Or in short form, welcome to SFIA, where we'll cheerfully discuss how to use hydrogen bombs to save the environment. Now climate change is inherently a politically controversial topic, and we'll be doing our best today to stay as far away from that as possible, so we'll enter this episode with only three assumptions regarding it. First, that climates change naturally and that you might not always like those changes and may want to minimize them. Second, that humans can change an environment through accident or intentional effort, if you don't believe that, stick around. Third, that minor changes to complex systems like our overall global ecosystem can have all sorts of unanticipated consequences. We've gotten much better at modeling those, but at least for now, precise weather and ecological modeling is unavailable to us. I believe those are all universally accepted by every faction with an opinion on climate change. A result of our third assumption, that our climate and ecology are rather chaotic, is that pretty much no matter what we do it's going to have unanticipated side effects and sometimes even the most minor tweaks can have massive unanticipated consequences. Just as an example, even something as small as switching to a type of lawn grass that was lighter or darker to cover 1% of Earth's surface so that it reflected or absorbed just 1% more sunlight would result in Earth absorbing or reflecting away about one ten thousandth more light than now. It sounds small but that is 20 terawatts of energy, which for comparison is 10 times humanity's total power consumption and parallel to the rate of heat energy released by a powerful hurricane. I think we'd all agree that's nothing to sneeze at. It's also about the amount of power needed to produce about 12 billion tons of aluminum a year, one of our more energy intensive metals to make. On that note, that amount of aluminum rolled at a 20 nanometer thickness, what we envision for aluminum solar sails, would cover a bit over 200 billion square kilometers of area, enough to entirely wrap Earth 400 times over. Remember that for later on. Small things can have huge effects on the environment, and since small things are usually cheaper and easier to do, they tend to be the preferred approach for geoengineering projects. And there's just one problem, small things can have huge effects on the environment, including unpredicted ones. We choose today to look at the big brute force approaches not because they are surgical, but because we can't perform surgery anyway. We simply lack the atmospheric, climatic, and ecological modeling capacity even with our best modern computers, to predict what little changes will do. On the other hand, raw brute force, which can obviously have unpredicted consequences too, has a certain simplicity to getting the job done. If your tweak has big unexpected consequences, you can brute force it back to where you want, which surgical approaches don't generally permit. Most of our climate change scenarios, natural or unnatural, cyclic or caused by things like volcanoes or asteroid impacts, do it through brute force of tinkering with how much light we get down here on the ground, and how slowly that light turned into heat gets radiated away. This gives us three basic approaches. Either remove the problem causing that effect, such as cutting down on how much carbon dioxide we produce, or removing that effect, such as removing that carbon dioxide from the air and sea by carbon sequestration, or flat out counteracting that effect, such as by decreasing the amount of light that can reach the ground and get absorbed and re-emitted as infrared. There is arguably a fourth approach too, but it's not really a solution so much as coming to terms with it. 
Now of course one could adapt to a changed world as is normally the case throughout our world's long history, though of course many things failed to adapt and went extinct. However you can also treat the effects too. If you're getting more rain and rising water levels, you can take advantage of that where it helps you, plants do love warmth, rain, and carbon dioxide after all, and you can work to mitigate effects where they hurt you. You can build seawalls to prevent coastal flooding and erosion from waves, while actively managing your waterways to keep that rain from draining all the soil and nutrients into the sea. You can create zoos and preserves and DNA storage vaults to prevent extinction or later reverse it, see the de-extinction episode, but these aren't really solutions so much as adaptation. Now as to solutions, you've always got the question of not just if it can be done, but does it cause additional problems, possibly worse ones? You also have to ask about cost. Can it be done by something else cheaper? Also, if possible, can we actually make a profit off it, directly or indirectly? Just as an example, if someone found out a way tomorrow to get fusion power working cheaply and easily so that we could churn out reactors that made electricity in bulk significantly cheaper than hydrocarbon fossil fuel plants, we could entirely eliminate the carbon footprint of power generation. Cheaper power is obviously a global economic boon, but we could also then turn a profit, sucking carbon dioxide out of the air, because gasoline is an amazing portable power source, and while it takes more energy to force carbon dioxide and water back together to make a hydrocarbon than you get burning it, what we really care about for mobile power generation is easy and portable energy and chemical fuels way outperform batteries in energy density and cost. You can then remove CO2 from the air and store it as liquid money. This basic technology was demonstrated by the Naval Research Laboratory for making jet fuel a number of years ago and can work with fission power plants, but the program was cancelled after long duration testing due to a lack of funding. It could be revived and possibly be an economical approach and this would presumably work all the better with fusion power. Of course we don't have fusion yet, except for fusion bombs, and though we've discussed using fusion bombs for economical power generation in mega reactors, this is just one of a handful of ways you could use nukes to save our planets. Another would be using it to blow up asteroids. Now asteroids have often caused climatic and ecological problems when they've hit our planet, and would be one case where you need to engage in climate change mitigation that has nothing to do with carbon dioxide. Indeed you might want to pump up your greenhouse gas production if one hit us to counterbalance any cooling effects from the debris. Key thought there, cooling effects from the debris. We often discuss asteroid mining on this channel and I've noted that you want to do all your mining and refining out of that asteroid and just bring the bits you want home, not drag the whole thing here at great cost of energy and risk accidentally dropping the thing on Earth, however minuscule that risk is. Of course it's a lot different if you do it on purpose. There's quite a few near-Earth asteroids we could bump with some carefully coordinated nuking into a collision path with Earth, then blow up just before it hit to scatter its bits and pieces so they burned up in the atmosphere and the debris rained down and helped cool the planet a little, just enough to reflect away maybe 1% of our sunlight you could potentially keep a long cycle of smaller asteroids coming from the belt too. Head out, strip the things down to manageable chunks depleted of all their precious and valuable metals like gold and platinum, then slug the thing towards Earth. Not the best space-based approach as we'll see, but it certainly gets the job done. Of course if you just want debris in the atmosphere, we can make it a lot closer to home. And no, not by scraping regolith off the moon and chucking it down to Earth via mass drivers, though if you need a quick and dirty solution you could nuke the heck out of the moon for a while and rely on all the debris kicked up by that in cislunar space to hang around the area blocking light, and it would have a very long dwell time before settling back down, but this of course would be quite problematic for future spacecraft. Another option is to get that debris from Earth, just nuke volcanoes and force them to erupt, and volcanoes of course are another of our frequent causes of climatic issues. It's all well and good to discuss dealing with carbon dioxide, but if we have a major volcanic eruption tomorrow, we need to be able to deal with that too. Now there is no opposite of a greenhouse gas, a greenhouse gas is any gas that absorbs radiation in any of the wavelengths or frequencies that Earth emits it, which incidentally is a much lower frequency of infrared than what comes off very hot objects like the Sun, 
most of the photons coming off the Sun are in the infrared range, not visible or ultraviolet frequencies, but infrared is a very large range of the spectrum compared to visible light. Quite a lot of gases do absorb infrared, generally the ones that don't are those composed of two of the same atom, like diatomic oxygen or nitrogen, or monatomic noble gases like helium or argon. As gases go, carbon dioxide isn't all that good of a greenhouse gas, but there are lots of things that produce it and it has a very long dwell time, as opposed to ozone, triatomic oxygen, or nitrous oxide, which don't last too long, or water which handily falls out of the sky after a bit. Needless to say, there are all gases that don't absorb infrared in any significant way, but there isn't any gas that anti-absorbs it so no anti-greenhouse gas. What we do have are things which either directly reflect light away when it comes in from the Sun, or which cause the formation of things which do, like clouds. Not all clouds do this job as well, after all clouds are made of water and water is a greenhouse gas, so it's got to be clouds that reflect more visible light than they're absorbing infrared. We can calibrate what aerosols we use for encouraging cloud formation and where to try to get the best cloud types. Our preferred candidate for this is sulfides, but launching them up there from aircraft or artillery is arguably counterproductive, since those tend to produce greenhouse gases to operate. Alternatively, we might just add some sulfides to aircraft on their regular flights, though since that takes extra fuel it isn't actually free. Lofting the stuff up there is going to cost energy, and our energy production via hydrocarbons is the issue of concern in the first place. This is exactly what something like a nuclear-powered railgun or mass driver or spacecraft launcher might be ideal for. When not chucking spaceships into orbit, it could be firing up larger pods of sulfides into the upper atmosphere to seed those reflective clouds. It's estimated it would take about 5 million tons of sulfur dioxide sent into the atmosphere every year to offset the CO2, less than a billion dollars a year of material, and your launch cost isn't much higher, though would vary depending on the launch mechanism. Now this all sounds good and it should work, but sulfur isn't the healthiest thing in the world and while the amounts are minimal, there's concerns it would have some negative effects on folks with breathing problems like asthma, and might damage the stratospheric ozone layer. One also hates to say it, since it would tend to be true of most methods, but it's also likely to have effects on the climate and ecology we did not anticipate any more than we anticipated a lot of the issues of other byproducts of industrial production. This is part of why I generally dislike the notion of using aerosols for climate control. It isn't that it doesn't work, but that it's essentially trying to fix the problem with another problem. Climate change factors are not limited to just things which alter how well we absorb and reflect sunlight, or emit infrared waste heat of that light afterward, but it is the big one, and carbon dioxide, asteroid impacts, or volcanoes are all essentially disrupting that reflection, absorption, and emission balance by altering the chemical properties of the atmosphere. Altering it more but in different ways always strikes me as a bit non-ideal. If you've got a pot of water you can add some salt so that it will boil at a higher temperature, you could lower that back down by decreasing the pressure in the room you're in, or changing the pot to lose heat to the outside air faster so less gets in the water, but it seems easier to just turn the heat down. Of course the heater in this case is the sun, which is hard to adjust the thermostat on, and while there are methods for doing this, see our episode on star lifting, Such efforts would be outside today's parameter of near-term solutions. What we can do instead though is effectively slide something between the Sun Flame and Earth Kettle to turn that thermostat down. That's essentially the notion with clouds, and we already suggested doing that in space by creating debris. However, I'm a big believer in getting two boards with one stone, or preferably a whole flock with a shotgun. So we'll move on to consider a method for cutting greenhouse gas emissions while lowering Earth's temperature in a way we can control and even reverse if we need to warm the planet for some reason, and do it all at a profit. We can employ measures to prevent the current issue worsening, but what we ideally want is something that leaves us in far better control against any such disaster scenario in the future too. We'll discuss that method momentarily but first a quick aside. I've mentioned using nuclear energy in the form of bombs or running mass drivers, 
but ultimately our biggest problem is getting all the energy we need while causing the minimum ecological and economic disruption or damage. Nuclear power, even regular old fission, really does work well for that though is hardly without its issues either. There is a habit of folks polarizing on the issue, either it's a horrible idea or one with nothing but benefits, and of course the truth lies somewhere in the middle, but in my opinion it tilts toward the latter. For power generation, if your option is fossil fuels or uranium, go with uranium. Similarly, if we can get better at making cheap and durable solar panels, that can replace or heavily supplement current power generation, and an improvement in battery technology would make that even better and let us do mobile energy like electric vehicles better too. You could also potentially make your solar panels highly reflective to any frequency they couldn't turn into electricity, and that might help quite a lot as well, as would minimal things like painting things more reflective colors. As we mentioned with grass near the beginning, even small changes to the planet's net reflection, its albedo, could help quite a lot. Of course the easiest way to raise that albedo without messing with our atmospheric composition or surface is to place mirrors far above the Earth, and if you've seen sky cities or sky platforms, you know there are ways we could do this with floating structures that would be far above what we think of as our atmosphere and where all the real weather happens. We'll discuss orbital versions in a moment, but there's a lot to be said about just making big reflective balloons and floating them up very high. Now you mostly put them up high to minimize weather issues, but the higher the better since at least some light is getting absorbed and turned into heat for every meter of air that light passes through and reabsorbed after being emitted as heat for every meter of air the waste infrared photons travel through before leaving the planet. This is part of why we don't want ground-based mirrors, which would be easier to do as they'd be a bit less effective. Mostly of course we just don't want to lose that land. Although wear and tear is an issue too. If you just stuck a reflective foil over deserts or tracts of deep ocean, all that sand and water is going to be a pain to keep clear and damage your mirrors. This is less of an issue high up, especially above the clouds where the air has thinned out to a tiny fraction of that sea level density. These would generally need constant replacement though if they relied on simple lifting gas buoyancy as they'd leak and probably get chewed up by solar and atmospheric wear and tear. It might be better to go for something like a big sheet that wasn't quite lighter than air so it could be sturdier and that wasn't just mirrors but had some solar collectors on it too to power thrusters to provide some speed and lift, that also keeps them in motion so they're spreading their shade around. I mentioned near the beginning that we could produce huge quantities of aluminum foil, enough to wrap the Earth many times over, with a fraction of the energy hitting Earth, and of course if we were getting a lot of our power from carbon neutral sources, that would mitigate the problem and even allow you to spend some of that power on carbon sequestration technologies. It takes energy to sequester carbon, and indeed as nice as trees are for doing it, they take energy too, we just don't have to plug them into a wall socket as they use sunlight and their leaves for it. I should note that plants aren't even vaguely efficient at carbon sequestration compared to existing technologies. You can sequester a lot more carbon with the same footprint of solar panels as a tree has leaves with just about any of our sequestration technologies and over a much shorter period of time, the issue is just economics. Though building and maintaining has a carbon footprint, all machines do since they are made by people who have carbon footprints, whereas a seed tossed in the dirt mostly grows and maintains itself. Just remember though, biology is generally not efficient, even if often more appealing as natural. Let's combine all these notions though. We have a device called a power satellite and we walk through the mechanics and economics of them in the episode of that name, but fundamentally they are giant big thin mirrors that bounce their light onto a solar thermal device that turns it into energy and then into microwaves then beams those microwaves down to us to be reconverted into electricity. They are thin and thus quite light, but most of their mass is abundant material and easy to make, it's just a reflective thin foil made from some metal like aluminum or steel either of which is very easy to source off the moon, see our episode Moon Industrial Complex for discussion of that. Now mining and manufacturing in space tends to seem high tech, and we'd assume it was grossly expensive to launch all components from Earth, 
but a simple remote controlled scuba robot and solo kiln on the Moon is well within modern technology. You would need a serious base on the Moon, but to be honest I think most of us would regard that as an added bonus. However, let's consider cost. We need to be able to reflect or shade maybe 1% of Earth overall to mitigate current thermal concerns, which would be about 5 trillion square meters of shade or mirror or power satellite dishes. We'd probably pessimistically need to replace them every decade, so we'd need to launch 500 billion square meters of foil into space a year. Launch costs are about $1,000 a kilogram now and would drop more if we were doing major work up there, but if we were assuming the very thin foil is intended for solar sails we mentioned near the beginning, that would be 20 nanometer thick sheets. You can stack 50 million of those a meter high, so 50 billion square meters of them would be a stack 100 meters by 100 meters by 1 meter, 10,000 cubic meters, so 27 million kilograms, or 2.7 billion dollars in launch costs at that $1,000 a kilogram figure. Mind you, this is just for launching the material alone, however. Now I suspect you'd go thicker, making and deploying sheets that thin is no easy task, but you'd find the balance point where the other manufacturing and deployment hassles and costs equaled out to the added launch costs of a thicker foil. It's easier to make thicker foils too, so if you were cutting launch costs by working from the moon with mostly automated equipment you might go pretty thick. Solar shades and mirrors are easy to make and cheap but to be useful and durable you need to include some power and guidance on them. They can do station keeping by bouncing sunlight around since they're essentially a big solar sail, but that requires some computerization and machinery on board, not just a paper thin sheet of shade or mirror. If you're doing all that, why not bounce that light onto a solar thermal power generator and ship it down to Earth as carbon neutral electricity, a source that can be used for carbon capture too as even with cooling we may want to reduce carbon levels which have some other climatic and ecological effects we may need to mitigate. How about a solar source not dependent on weather or time of day? Why not use it to power anti-asteroid lasers to protect us from an asteroid impact and climate change from that? Why not include the ability to swivel so they can just bounce more light down to Earth in case we need to brighten or warm things after a volcanic eruption? Indeed as your computerization improves, you might be able to use them in tandem with superior weather modeling to control the weather and mitigate hurricanes and more extreme storms. You could even do rotating ones on more polar orbits to shade the Arctic region disproportionately and help ice formation, which also reflects sunlight along with storing water to mitigate ocean rising. And the best thing is that you could do it all at a profit. As we mentioned in Power Satellites, for space-based industry to really take off, It helps to have a major sector of the global economy that can be done in space, and the energy sector is trillions of dollars a year. Could we do it today? Well, actually yes, but probably not at a profit just yet. I suspect economy of scale and experience doing it and improving designs would actually permit that even with modern tech, but to really make it profitable, which is obviously preferable, you really need to improve automation so we could get around launch costs by doing it from the moon including building most of the non-simple shade or meal components, or get launch costs a good deal lower. We've discussed a lot of options for that in our Upward Bound series, many of which we could build today but only economically if we were seriously scaling up how much stuff we threw into space, but of course if you're shipping a million tons of shade, meal, and power production into space every year, that's pretty scaled up. So while there are a lot of near-term solutions for climate change we might use, if I had my own pick I'd go all in for power satellites. All that cheap energy, and carbon neutral at that, would represent a massive economic boon across all sectors of our global economy, let us run carbon capture, give us quite a nice infrastructure in space for our other space-based goals and aspirations, and let us begin contemplating serious weather control operations and we wouldn't have to devote any extra land to energy production or carbon sequestration efforts too, or tinker with our atmosphere's chemical composition. It's not something we could literally do tomorrow, but it's hardly for our future stuff either, and it's a solution that not only doesn't force us to curtail our dreams by limiting our economy and production, but actually could be a huge benefit to enhancing those and making our dreams of space come true. 
why get two bullets with one stone when you can use a shotgun and get a whole flock? We were talking about climate change mitigation today, and one part we mostly skipped was the whole notion of waste, recycling, and garbage. About the same time I was writing this we did an episode topic poll where the future of garbage came up as a topic, and I decided we'd do it as a companion video for today's episode. And you can catch that as an early release over on Nebula, along with our other early releases like Can We Have a Trillion People on Earth? Or our Nebula exclusives like our Coexistence with Alien series. Nebula, our new subscription streaming service, was made as a way for education-focused independent creators to try out new content that might not work too well on YouTube, where algorithms tend not to be too kind to some topics, or demonetize certain ones entirely, or just don't fit our usual content. If you'd like to get free access to it, it does come as a free bonus with a subscription to CuriosityStream, which also has thousands of amazing documentaries you can watch, on top of Nebula exclusive content from myself and many other creators like CGP Grey, Minute Physics, and Wendover. A year of CuriosityStream is just $19.99, and it gets you access to thousands of documentaries, as well as complimentary access to Nebula for as long as you're a subscriber, and use the link in this episode's description, curiositystream.com slash Isaac Arthur. I mentioned today that when climate change happens our ecology slowly adapts to it, and that one option is that we would adapt, but that takes a long time to occur naturally. However, there may be artificial routes that can be done even in existing organisms, not just subsequent generations, and we'll explore those more next week in DNA Manipulation of Living Beings. The week after that, we'll return to the Fermi Paradox series for a look at the Zoo Hypothesis, the notion we don't see aliens because they are keeping us unable to, essentially living in their zoo. Before those episodes though, we also have our monthly livestream Q&A coming up this Sunday, February 23rd at 4pm Eastern Time, and I hope to see you there. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes, visit our website, IsaacArthur.net, to donate to the show or look over our inventory of over 200 episodes or our awesome SFIA merchandise. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week. Thank you.